linguist and thinker Dr. Samuel Johnson once said, patriotism is the last refuge of the scoundrel, as a warning to not seek simple solutions to complex problems. Science fiction author Isaac Asimov later paraphrased it as, violence is the last refuge of the incompetent. But today, on the 19th of October, 1962, American President John F. Kennedy receives very competent advice as to why violence should be the simplest and most patriotic response to the Cuban Missile Crisis. This is Time Ghost with the Cuban Missile Crisis. I'm Indy Nidell. Yesterday, Kennedy leaned towards not going to war with Cuba, but declaring a blockade instead. And Defense Secretary Robert McNamara had seemed to get some support from the military for that idea. Today, the Joint Chiefs of Staff of the US Armed Forces try hard to sway Kennedy back to the path of military action. On Cuba, there were many, 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 many more Soviets than US intelligence presumes, and they are hard at work readying their missiles for deployment. The CIA has been trying to work out where the Soviet nuclear warheads were stored. Obviously, knowing this is the prerequisite for the US Air Force taking them out with targeted strikes, and would significantly increase the appeal of a limited airstrike as a solution. One location they have been observing for months is a bunker complex near Bejucal, about a 45-minute drive south of Havana. But they have by now discarded this as a possible option, since they didn't see any recent improvements to the facility, it wasn't very well guarded, and was in fact only protected by a chain-link fence. Bejucal surrounds a small township founded in 1831. Other than being the terminal station of Cuba's first railroad, and hosting a very popular carnival festival, it's a fairly insignificant place. On a random side note, actor Andy Garcia was born there six years before the crisis, but he and his family fled to the US last year. Anyhow, the CIA are very much mistaken. This is where the warheads are in fact stored. In a modified hillside bunker complex, there are now 160 nuclear warheads being prepared to be mounted on missiles and armed. A veteran of the Soviet nuclear armed forces, Colonel Sergei Romanov, is in charge of the operation. The working conditions are abysmal. In Cuba, the warm and humid tropical climate makes it difficult to maintain the right conditions for what is a very sensitive and a very dangerous job. Romanov scrounges whatever air conditioners his Cuban hosts can lay their hands on, but finally resorts to requisitioning loads and loads of ice to cool the inside of the bunker. Much worse, though, is the imperceptible radiation. Many of the workers will develop cancer and die from this radioactive exposure over the coming months and years. There's also the stress of maybe being discovered and bombed by the United States. There is hardly any time or any peace of mind to sleep. The strain is already taking its toll on Romanov's health, and he will die of a heart attack shortly after returning to the Soviet Union. His second-in-command, Major Boris Boltenko, also a nuclear force veteran, is even now suffering from undiagnosed brain cancer from prolonged exposure and will also die in a few months. Today, they are finally getting rid of at least some of the warheads. The first batch of the gadgets, as they call them, is ready to be shipped to the missile sites. The chosen destination is a remote missile location at the center of the island. Unit Commander Colonel Sidorov has made progress there far more quickly than expected with preparing the rockets. His unit is also the best concealed and most difficult to strike from the air. The warheads are loaded onto a convoy of 20 trucks that will travel 14 hours by night on primitive jungle roads. To avoid detection, they use no headlights, and only every fourth truck uses side lights to allow the convoy to stay on the road. Sidorov finalizes preparations so that the first warheads can be mounted already tomorrow. The Soviets will then only need a 30-minute window to arm and launch the missiles. In the White House, the assumption, or should I say the hope, is that this window is 18 hours, which would allow the U.S. to act without the danger of immediate nuclear retaliation. Though as of today, the U.S. does correctly assume the total Cuban nuclear arsenal, including ICBMs, will be deployable sometime in the next two months. At 9.45 a.m., President Kennedy receives the Joint Chiefs of Staff. They still want to convince him to make a military strike, as I said before. Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, General Taylor, says... 
say that we felt we were not united on the military requirement here, that we cannot accept Cuba as a, a missile base, that we should either eliminate or neutralize the missiles there and prevent any, any others coming in. Well, from a military point of view, that meant three things. First, attack with the benefit of surprise uh, those known missiles and offensive weapons that we knew about. Uh, secondly, continued surveillance then to see what the effect would be. And third, a blockade to prevent the others from coming in. I would say, again, from a military point of view, that seemed clear we were united on that. He goes on to say that they are not unanimous regarding invasion and what political action to also take in parallel. Kennedy replies. Let me just say a little uh, first about the, the problem is, uh, from this point, uh, my point of view, uh, first, uh, I think we ought to think of why the Russians did this. Well, actually, it was a rather uh, dangerous but rather useful play of theirs. If we do nothing, they have a missile base there with all the pressure that brings to bear in the United States and damage to our prestige. If we attack uh, Cuba, the missiles or Cuba, in any way, uh, give them a clear uh, line to uh, take Berlin, uh, as they were able to do Hungary under the Anglo uh, war in Egypt, uh, we will have been regarded as uh, the Fixation about Cuba anyway, we'll be regarded as the trigger happy Americans who uh, lost Berlin. We would have no support among our allies. Kennedy goes on to weigh the options at hand, explaining why he might prefer a blockade, but he also says, On the other hand, we've got to do something because to do nothing, we're going to have a problem with Berlin anyway. Uh, it's been very clear last night. We're going to have this thing right now. I've got some about two months. And, uh, so we've got to do something. He then outlines all the difficulties that they're presented with on a diplomatic level if they should attack Cuba, especially regarding Berlin. Then Taylor says, We, we recognize all these things, Mr. President, but I think we'd all be unanimous in saying that really our, our strength in Berlin, our strength any place in the world, is the credibility of our response uh, under certain conditions. And if we don't respond here in Cuba, we think the credibility of our response right. in Berlin that's is right. right. So that's why we've got to respond. Now the question is, are we to respond? <clears throat> General Curtis LeMay, chief of the U.S. Air Force, shares his views. Well, uh, I certainly agree with everything General Taylor has said, uh, and emphasized a little strongly, perhaps, that uh, uh, we don't have any choice except throughout military action. Uh, if we do this blockade as proposed and political action, the first thing that's going to happen is your missiles are going to disappear into the woods, particularly your, your mobile ones. Admiral George Anderson, Chief of Naval Operations, explains that he could carry out the blockade and it would be easier to enforce complete blockade than partial, but... If we institute a complete blockade, we are immediately having a confrontation with the Soviet Union because it's the Soviet block ships which are taking the material to, to uh, Cuba. So he too thinks decisive, preemptive military action is preferable. Chief of Staff of the U.S. Army, General Earl Bus Wheeler, wants his forces to join in with boots on the ground. Mr. President, uh, in my judgment, from a military point of view, the lowest risk uh, course of action, uh, if we're thinking of protecting the people of the United States against a possible strike uh, on us, is to go ahead with a surprise airstrike, a blockade, and an invasion. The conversation gets testier. LeMay says... I think that uh, a blockade and political talk would be considered by uh, a lot of our uh, friends and neutrals have made a pretty weak response uh, to this, and I'm sure a lot of our own citizens would feel that way too. In other words, you're in a pretty bad fix, President. You're in a pretty bad fix. Yeah. 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 <laughs> they debate how certain they can be of Soviet missiles being ready and when and how to deal with fallout against Guantanamo, the U.S. base on Cuba. The conversation moves more and more towards the practicalities of military action until finally they start looking at dates. They conclude that the military can be ready to begin a blockade and do airstrikes the day after tomorrow, so Sunday the 21st. To really get it right though, they prefer Tuesday the 23rd. Then there's the question of invasion. Going 
Obviously, Taylor does not know about the tens of thousands of Soviet forces armed with tactical nuclear weapons that are awaiting them on Cuba. No matter what, the Joint Chiefs of Staff are anxious to move ahead, but Kennedy still isn't sure to even respond at all. Wheeler asks, Dave, uh, uh, am I clear that you're, you addressing yourself as to whether anything at all should be done, but that if, if military action is to be taken, you have made My question is, they sum up the meeting and conclude that for all eventualities, they will continue preparing the military options. Kennedy leaves for his waiting helicopter. Not knowing that they're still being recorded, the chiefs wait until they think the coast is clear and then air their frustrations about not being able to decisively move ahead. Expressing an astonishing amount of wishful thinking, they interpret the president's non-committal statements as a discreet way of telling them that they should move ahead, at least with airstrikes to take out the missiles. Even General David Schopp of the Marines, who is the only military man there opposed to an invasion, feels they have Kennedy's unspoken support for airstrikes, while acknowledging that no matter what you do in this situation, you are screwed. That no matter what you do in this situation, you are screwed. In fact, Kennedy is not at all convinced of any military action, and still the preparations go ahead. As we've said earlier, when you let out the slack on the leash of the dogs of war, there's a real risk they might slip out of your hand. By the time Kennedy lands for campaign rallies in Ohio, the world has taken yet another step towards nuclear war. I will see you tomorrow on day five as Kennedy tries to unring the bells that he inadvertently rung today. If you just joined us, you can see the first daily episode, day zero, right here. And if you want more great content, join our Time Ghost army and support us at timeghost.tv or patreon.com. Good night and good luck. Ooh.